All right, thank you, Megan, for such an awesome introduction. So just as a little background information on myself, as Megan mentioned, my name is Kurt Chalitz, and I am a senior informatics consultant here at CSOLS, and I do specialize in program and project management, and as it says, strategic consulting. So over the years, I've accumulated over six years of consulting in the informatics space. Um, I've had some experiences in consumer products with biopharma and with petrochemical. So a nice spread of the spectrum where we might find some limbs implementations. Uh, as the bullet point says there, I've got 23 years in information technology. It's a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, technically, that's 38 years if you count the fact that I developed and sold my first computer game when I was 12. But uh, that makes me seem too old. So 23 works. I've uh, worked with infrastructure and architecture. Uh, developed applications. I've done identity management for Fortune 100 companies and the US government, and I've done video game design and development. Uh, some of you might be familiar with some of my work in that area. Uh, one of my games, the very first game that I personally developed, actually made the front and back cover of Computer Gaming World and was Game of the Year back in X year. Uh, it was called Shadowcaster, and sadly, probably nobody recognizes that name. But yet, uh, some of the other work that I've done that didn't receive those accolades, you might recognize, like uh, Doom, or Hexen, or Heretic, or Quake. Uh, some of those seem to ring bells with a few people. Uh, in addition, uh, I also have developed um, a polyphonic software synthesizer, which is used in most cell phones today, and that API got adopted by Java and is now what they call Java Sound. So I've done a lot of different things over the years. Uh, among some of those things, I developed Labware for over 10 years. Uh, I also wrote a LIMS system from scratch a number of years ago as well, and I've been developing LIMS systems for quite a few years as well. I was trained in project management professional uh, back in 2015. I became a certified Scrum Master back in 2008. I am a Microsoft Certified System Engineer since 2003. And for those who want to know, I did triple major back in college with molecular biology, biochemistry, and computer science. I also went to law school, uh, Lincoln Law School of San Jose, and uh, focused on contract law. With that, let's get into things. This is the agenda for today. We're going to be talking about the importance of testing. Uh, now, many of you already know the importance of testing when it comes to software development, but we're going to talk about the real return on the investment that you're going to get when you do your testing, because I think that's often neglected, and it's really critical to understanding why we want to do this. We're going to talk about the types of testing that are available to us, uh, particularly when it comes to working with labware, and the right time that we'd want to implement those tests in the software development lifecycle. We're going to focus quite a bit on unit testing, because that's going to be our power horse. That's where we're going to get the most bang for our buck. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to optimize our unit tests to make them nice and fast, and that would include how to stub out for databases and for instrument integration. And then toward the end, we're going to discuss how we can make that completely automatic uh, to really bump up that return on your investment. And as Megan said, we'll save a little time at the end for any questions that you might have. So if you haven't found it yet, please do look over on the right-hand panel. Make sure you find where you can enter the questions. Enter them if you have any as I go, and Megan will pass those to me at the end of the presentation. All right. The importance of testing is something that we are pretty much all aware of, and most of us have seen a graph that looks something like this. The idea is that if you are able to catch an issue early on in your development process, the cost to address that issue is fairly minimal. But if that issue is somehow able to progress its way all the way into and close to or even all the way through to production, the cost to fix or address that issue goes way, way up. And so your return on your investment, as the bullet says, decreases exponentially as the costs increase. Well, that's all fine and good. I mean, we're all kind of familiar with this idea, but I'm really a numbers guy, and I'm, I'm kind of a geek. So I really wanted to know, what does that mean? What kind of return on investment am I really going to get? Well, I spend a lot of time reading articles on scholar.google.com, and I found one in particular that I think really illustrates this quite well. This was a study that was done by uh, Hewlett-Packard, and they published it in their uh, HP journal. 
This was done over uh, a couple of years, and they looked at all of their projects that they had going on in great detail. So what they determined was that the true return on their investment during the review phase, and for Hewlett Packard's purposes, review in this case meant anything from requirements gathering up to and including the code review, was 787%. Well, what does that 787% mean? If you take the lump sum of money that they're assigning to, say, the developers, uh, managers, uh, business analysts, and so forth, and you take all of that money during the requirements gathering phase, if they found an issue during the requirements gathering phase, okay, take all that money, and now we imagine that issue, that same issue, moves all the way through to production, to fix that same issue in production, would cost an additional 787% above what that lump of money would have been back in this review phase. The next bullet point is something we're going to be focusing on mostly during this presentation, and that's the development phase. HP found that during the development phase, the return on investment was 229%. It's still a really big number. And here's something that I want to mention, too. This particular study was focusing on IT, not pharma. So for those of you who are in the pharma industry, these numbers are actually even higher. So that's another something to consider. But here's something that really struck me when I really saw it in print. It's something that I kind of intuitively knew, but seeing it in print really had an impression on me. And that was that catching bugs past the development stage resulted in a net loss to the company in all cases. In other words, if you allowed an issue to move out of your development stage, you would never be able to make up the return on the investment. It would always cost you more to fix it after development than it would have cost you to fix it during development. That's a very important point, and that's why this talk today is so important. I want to level set on the types of testing that are out there that we can use with Labware and the times that we would test. I'm not going to read this slide because we're going to go through each of these in detail, but on the left you can see the types of testing that we're going to cover, and on the right, the times of testing. I'm going to start today discussing and level setting on the types of testing that are out there. The first type of test is the code review. Now, a lot of people look at this and say, a code review, that's not a test, but in reality, it really is, because what you're doing during a code review is you're testing against established coding standards. Now, if your organization isn't currently using coding standards, we highly recommend that you implement them as soon as possible. And if you need a little um, place to get started with that, Labware has a great coding standard that you can use as a uh, standard to start with. And then you can add on to that and make it something that fits your organizational needs. The reason why the code review is so important is because before you even get something into uh, a unit test or into an integration test, and we'll talk about those later, you can detect types of runtime errors, uh, just looking to see if something is syntactically not entered incorrectly that would generate a runtime error uh, at runtime when you push this thing out to production. You can also detect performance issues. So for example, if your code has a SQL statement that's doing a count star, when you might just need a row count. Uh, that could pull back a lot more rows than you intended and make the system slow down. Uh, data initialization problems. If you have variables that need to be initialized to null or to zero or whatnot that are not properly initialized, you can catch that just doing a simple code review. So the code review, in terms of the development reviews, uh, will definitely save you the most time and the money. This is going to get you a huge return on your investment. But there are definitely things that the code review cannot do. It is difficult to detect intermittent problems, and it's very difficult to detect integration issues during a code review. But that's okay. There's other tests that we can do that will detect those things, and we'll talk about those coming up. Next, I want to discuss the unit test. And the unit test is the powerhouse 
of our testing for limbs and really for any, uh, uh, sorry, for lab or for really any limb system. Think of a unit test as a single piece of a larger puzzle. And I like to use this analogy because like the puzzle piece that has inputs and outputs, the unit test should be focused on a subroutine, which itself has inputs and outputs. The unit test should be atomic. And let me just break that down a little bit. What does atomic mean? Atomic means that the unit test should be able to stand alone. It should have no dependencies on any other tests. And as one of my bullets down there uh, also illustrates, it should not have any dependency on any kind of test data. A unit test should be able to create and destroy its own test data. A unit test should be fast. Now, in terms of labware, we're talking about under a second to up to three seconds. That's sort of the sweet spot range that you want to shoot for. So to do that, you want to try to make sure that anything that's slowing down your subroutine, such as a call to an external database or an instrument integration, is actually what we call stubbed out. And we'll talk about that a little bit more coming up. The idea is you want to try to make that call as fast as possible in near zero time. We also want to talk about something called the 80-20 rule. So when you're developing your unit tests, you want to make sure that as an industry best practice, you try to cover about 80% of the functionality of that unit test. 